Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, I praise Allah, the Creator of the heavens and the earth, and I send peace and blessings to all of the prophets from the beginning of time. From the time of Adam, alayhi salam, to Noah, to Abraham, to Moses, to Jesus, to Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, all those righteous ones who walk the face of the earth. And I begin with the greeting words of the righteous. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was the last of a long series of messengers and prophets. They came to every part of the world. Prophets came to China, to India, to Russia, to Southeast Asia, to Africa, to Europe, to the Americas. And what united these messengers of Allah was the belief in one God. But the final Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, not only confirmed Tawheed, he not only confirmed the unity of belief, but he also confirmed or developed the unity of people themselves. And so amongst his followers were people not only from the Arabian Peninsula, but from Persia, from Europe, from Ethiopia, from all parts of the known world. The Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, dealt with his followers with love, regardless of their color, regardless of the language that they spoke. Amongst his illustrious companions, there are 25 Sahaba who are listed to be from Al-Habasha, from Abyssinia. They were the best of the Sahaba. They had come from their countries, they had struggled, they were striving with the other believers, and there are a few of them who are very prominent in the annals of history. Umm Ayman, radiallahu anha, it is reported by the books of Sira, the prophetic biography, that she was the dry nurse of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and when his mother passed away, she was the one who brought him back to Mecca. She remained an important person to him all of his life. Even later in Medina, when they mentioned that Umm Ayman was in, was in his presence, the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, although he was the last messenger and also a mighty ruler, he would stand and he would greet her with love. From amongst the Ethiopian companions of the Prophet Sallallahu was also Sayyidina Bilal radiallahu anhu. And he is known as the caller to prayer. He is known as the one who suffered severely during the Meccan period. And when he was being tortured, he would cry, Ahad, Ahad, one. He confirmed and maintained his belief in the one God. And it is reported that the Prophet, peace be upon him, on one occasion, when he was given a vision of paradise, he heard sounds and he recognized the footsteps of Bilal. And so Bilal was promised paradise, radiallahu anhu, before his death. Amongst the Ethiopian companions also was Menhaj al-Habashi, Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr al-Habashi, Shukran al-Habashi, Hilal al-Habashi, Amir al-Habashi, and the list goes on, and there are over 25 who are mentioned amongst the major companions. In a minor sense, there were many scores of Ethiopians who were also engaged with the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, in the struggle for the establishment of Islam. During the rule of the Khilafat of Umar ibn al-Khattab, the second caliph, it is reported that activity was going on in the Red Sea, in the islands just below Jeddah. 
And it is reported that Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu an dispatched an, ex an expedition to the coast of Jidda in order to see what was happening and if possible to give dawah to the people they found on the islands in the Red Sea. When they returned, Umar remembered the saying of the Prophet, peace be upon him, who has said, leave the Abyssinians as long as they do not interfere with you. And so based upon this understanding of the important role that Al-Habasha had played in the early times, and the sayings of the Prophet, peace be upon him, Umar ibn al-Khattab and the early Khulafa, the leaders of Islam, never sent any military expeditions into Ethiopia or in that region. What actually happened was a natural relationship between the merchants coming from the coast near Jeddah and southern Arabia and going across into the Horn of Africa. The books of history report, especially during the Umayyad period, that large numbers of people crossed the Red Sea. They crossed into the Horn of Africa and they established business ports in the eastern side of Africa and also on the Dahlak Islands. We find reports given by the Umayyads and then later on by the Abbasids during their rule of Islam. We find information showing a brisk trade that was going on, especially on the Dahlak Islands and in a place known as Zayla. The companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him, entered into Ethiopia. And these are the first real reports that we get about Islam coming into this region since the time of an Najashi, the great emperor of Ethiopia. The companions in a natural trade relationship with the people did not come as conquerors. They did not come to engage, <coughs> to engage themselves in military activities, but they came as merchants, as wandering scholars, as people who were reaching out to another land with the expectation that they would find brotherhood and solidarity. And so it is reported that the companions traveled into Ethiopia and then went further on higher into the mountains, high into now what is known by history as Aksum. And when they reached high into the mountains, they found a number of settlements. These settlements were established by people many hundreds of years before their time. And it is reported that high in the mountains, they found a settlement known today as Harar. It was a mysterious part of the world, founded somewhere between the 7th to the 9th century AD. And one of the distinguishing points about this region, and especially Hara, right from the beginning, was the fact that it was the home of many important spices, and it is the home of the original coffee. The people of Hara cultured coffee, and they developed the use of coffee, and they spread it out to the Arabian Peninsula, and now coffee is being used throughout the planet. The people of Hara were Semitic-speaking people. The people of Hara had developed a type of spirituality and a type of unity from early times. And we find, especially in the 10th century AD, we find a great scholar, Sheikh Abadir, coming into the region, into Hara, and establishing what is known as the Ahli system. The city of Hara was built behind huge walls, and the Ahli system was based upon the relationship of the people in the city to the masjids. According to the fiqh of Imam al-Shafi, rahimahullah, it takes about uh, 40 people to establish Jumu'ah. Once 40 men have established themselves in an area, it is permissible in the Shafi uh, tradition, which was the prevailing understanding of uh, uh, jurisprudence in that region, 
then Juma becomes compulsory on the people. So based upon uh, this system, the Ahli uh, method was developed. This is a very important system, especially for Muslims today who are in isolated areas and who need to develop themselves and, and, and raise themselves to a higher level other than, other than just coming to the masjid for prayers. The mosque was the center of community activity. The mosque was not only a spiritual place, but it was also a place where political decisions could be made. In the Ahli system, for every 40 families, there was an imam and a masjid. And so in Hara, what developed is a complicated uh, web of masajid, of masjids, with an imam as, as the responsible person. And this leader, or amir, or imam in that area, was responsible not only to establish salat and to educate the children in the Qur'an and Islamic sciences, but he was also responsible for the welfare of the people who were living in the vicinity of that masjid. Hara, because of this system, uh, takes on a special meaning in Islamic history. Some historians even look to Hara and, and they give us the information that in this mysterious walled city that there are more masjids per square meter than anywhere else in the face on, on the face of the planet Earth. A masjid every time you turn, every section of the city is a place to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so the people of Hara developed themselves, 82 masjids within a circumference of 3,348 meters. These masjids, these houses of worship, became the hubs of activity. And because of that, the very culture of Hara itself took on uh, a very high spiritual level. The people of Hara were oriented to Islamic sciences and they developed a powerful uh, grasp of the Arabic language and the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so Hara was well known for this system. Within uh, this Ahli system as well was a political concept that each Amir or each Imam who represented his people would take the opinions of his people or the problems that they expressed to a Majlis Ashura and that formed the government of the whole of Hara and there was an Amir over the government. So they developed a type of Islamic system, a mini Islamic state within the walls of this city in Ethiopia. And there they were able to come together to know each other, not only as people who prayed, but also to know the subtleties of each other's families, to know the needs and the wants, and to always pray for each other in times of difficulty. Let us take a break and come back after a few moments to discuss more about the mysterious city of Hara. <laughs> If you look into the early tafsir, early exegesis of the Quran, you will find that uh, all the mufassirin were trying to find out where are the seven earths. Earthquakes, natural or artificial, can delineate the boundaries between seven different zones within the earth. The, the conclusion that we have seven different layers within the earth came to notice only in the 20th century. The true believer would prostrate down in obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the blessings of that prostration will reach the seventh earth. The city of Hara, high in the Ethiopian mountains, was a city of mystery and a city of 